I am still here and you are back with me. You see me, but I do not see you. So we found from the outline that what happens when Jesus is done speaking is that there is a division. The word here is schism. Schisms get used in lots of ways, but a schism occurred among the Jews. Now, we do not know if he's referencing to the Jewish leaders, to those who are responsible for the temple where he is doing his teaching, or if this is referring to the crowd, the crowd that is gathered. Because he uses this language, you die, oi, those people from Judea, um, in different ways. And we can't just say it's the same group of people each time. But many of them are saying, well, he has a demon. He is insane. Why do you listen to him? Well, hmm. But others were saying, these are not the sayings of one demon possessed. And besides that, a demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? So here we have that wrap up with chapter nine. And then it says, at the time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. Okay, if it goes with that, then maybe they're thinking back to the fall, earlier in the fall. But I think this all fits with this festival of booths, festival of tabernacles that is taking on. So we have a division. It's not the first time we've had a division. You can go back to chapter 7. You can go to chapter 9 when there's a division over what Jesus is doing and saying. It's not the first time that they've talked about him having a demon in chapter 7, which, if you remember, 7 through 10, 21 is all one festival. We're talking within about 8 to 10 days total. If we move from the peak day to things that happen while he is still in Jerusalem. And in chapter 8, there's discussion about a demon. And then is perhaps the key word, right? Why do you listen to him? Why do you listen to him? Why do you akuo hear? And not only hear, but actually act upon. So some people are starting to believe. And so if we look at John chapter 1, and we look at the disciples of John the baptizer, right? John says for a second time, behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and followed Jesus. So they listened and they acted. So when you listen and act, well, that is the language that is being used in this particular situation. We can then jump forward into chapter three, not once again to Nicodemus, which we have covered in sufficient detail with our examples, but it is there in chapter three eight or first eight sorry not chapter eight but we go down to chapter three verse 29 right he who has the bride is the bridegroom but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him listens to him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice the voice the voice that causes people to listen which we heard in the parables is an important part so we listen to the voice of verse then 32. What he has seen and heard of that he testifies. No one receives his testimony of what he has seen and heard, what he has listened to, that which is from above. And this is chapter three, so we can go back to Nicodemus and that language pretty easily. In chapter four, right? We have a statement by, right, the people of the city. It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves. And so listening, acting, believing, 
all kind of fit together in this particular passage in which we see chapter seven, those who say he's a demon are accusing other people of listening to Jesus who should not be listened to because he has a demon. They're going, hey, <laughs> no demon healed a blind person. This guy can't have a demon. A demon, people don't talk like this. So the vision is happening over these things. Hmm, listening. And then just for a wrap up, chapter six. At the end of chapter six, we have the end of the language of the eating and drinking. And many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? Who can obey it? It's in the ancient world, a kuo, to hear means to obey. doesn't mean just have sound waves pass through your ears to make um, impressions upon the ear drum and then be processed into audio signals into your brain as you are now having happen while I speak voices into this microphone but it has to do with acting upon that doing something about it which is why the great Shema says listen Israel hear O Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one act upon it live a certain way it's not just information to be processed so now in john chapter 10 we have a shift in the festival okay it is the feast of dedication which is not going to be found in most protestant old testaments because it has to deal with the maccabee revolt revolt and reclaiming the temple and purifying the temple. And it is what we currently call Hanukkah, at least in the Western world. It happens in the winter, typically December. Not that there are winters or anything like that of the Northern Plains of the US, but Jesus is walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon around an entry place attributed to Solomon, even though this is not solomon's temple they still have a place they attribute to solomon and the jews gathered around him are they the same group of people that were there in chapter 10 verse 19 well probably not because it's now a few months later and they ask him how long will you keep us in suspense are you the messiah same question asked John the Baptizer. Are you the Messiah? And Jesus said, hey, I told you, but you don't believe the works that I do. The work, K-S, that I do. Why are you going to believe me? And then, make it more confusing, he says, you're not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. And he's repeating what was said earlier. Oh, darn, I thought it was so easy to understand, but no, it's not. <clears throat> Is this wrapping up the early part of John 10? Or is he simply using the analogy of sheep a second time? Like I said, John 10 is the chapter that is the most difficult to unravel. Because where does it fit chronologically? How does it fit chronologically? So, his works, the things he does. What have we had so far? Well, we've had lots of signs. We've had some that have been described in at least some detail and others that are just made reference to. And we have the words of none other than Nicodemus. You are a teacher sent from God because no one could do the works that you do if God were not with him. And so we have all of those things that are happening and then they don't get too worried about his sheep language. But then he says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. Talking about sheep. I and the father are one. 
Boom. Lower the boom. It is not a mic drop. It is a boom drop. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. I am the Father of one. E. Little problem with Shema. A lot of challenges about Trinitarian language that is not the discussion here. But it's not the first time. We go back to chapter 8 and look at that discussion that he had with them at various points, starting around verse 16. Even if I do judge, my judgment is true. I am not alone in it, for I am the Father who sent me. So he's saying, I and the Father are connected, right? In your law, the testimony of two men is true. I am the one who testifies about myself. The Father sent me, testifies about me. And they ask about who his Father is. Then we go down to verse 28. It's still a continuation of the same lengthy discussion. When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and I do nothing on my own initiative. I speak these things as the Father taught me. So here's an I am statement that is like, I am speaking the words of the Father. That makes me basically the same as the Father. It continues down into verse 42. If God were your Father, you would love me, for I have proceeded forth, have come from God, for I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me which is the language that he used up above. And in 54, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It's my father who glorifies me of whom you say he is our God. So he's saying, I and the father are the same. We are on the same pathway. We are on the same uh, radio signal. We are on the same directional course. We're on the same highway. We're sitting in the same car going the same direction. And in chapter 8 is when he says, before Abraham was, I am stating this. They pick up stones to throw at him and left the temple. And now in John 10. Right? They pick up stones to stone him and Jesus talks to them. He responds to them. So it's a little different. Then John 8, where he disappears, here has a conversation. We're still building towards the end. It says, so what, what work, with a K, are you stoning me for? Which of the things that I did is deserved of stoning? And they say, it's not a good work. It is the words with a D. You make yourself out to be God. Oh, they should have read the prologue. But they didn't have the prologue. They're dealing with Jesus before the prologue is written. And they're thinking that what he's saying is something that cannot be possible. Right? And Jesus said, well, but isn't it written in the law? I said, you are gods. This is actually from the Psalms. And if you call them gods to whom the word of God came, do you say of him whom the father testified, you're blasphemy because I said, I am the son of God? And then it comes back to his works with a K. Though sometimes it's the D, words with a D, that gets him in trouble. If I do not do the works of my father, then don't believe me. But if I do the works of my father, do, 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 logic, do not do, do not believe, do, dorks, do, believe. And then they sought to seize him. They were going to do something. He had a little conversation this time. It's a difference from chapter eight. But he eluded their grasp because it was not yet his time. At which point he now... vanishes at least from judea crosses over the jordan and goes into the trans jordan region where it's not quite as volatile and he was staying there 
and many people were coming to him. Where John, and he mentions John again, so there's another reference to John at the beginning. And people said, John didn't do any signs, yet everything John said is true about this person. But this guy's doing signs. This guy's amazing. And the result is in verse 42, many believed in him. So we see that at the first division, many were thinking about believing. And here they are believing because of the signs which he did. And so we have a connection once again to John the baptizer. And what did he say in chapter one? What did he say in chapter three? And remembering the testimony of John who did no signs, but they're saying, but this, what John said about this person. So they know that Jesus was teaching about, I'm sorry, not Jesus was teaching, John the baptizer was teaching about the Messiah who was coming, of which all the things he said, that he is greater than I. I'm not able to untie the sandals of his shoes, or those, uh, untie his sandals, the strings of his sandals, the laces of the sandals. He must increase, I must decrease. That leaves us with a great deal of conflict as now within a few months between John 8 and John 10 in the fall of the year fall and winter of the year they have individuals among the Jews who are wanting to stone Jesus to kill him by stones throwing them at him in the holy temple this place behind me which is still under construction as we know from John chapter 3, for 46 years, it's been under construction. And they want to pick up some stones, construction stones, perhaps, and throw them at him. They do not like what he is saying, and they want to, him to die because he says he is one with God. That is the line of demarcation. Is he or is he not? And then... He comes back from the other side and enters Judea one last time at the house of his friend Lazarus. But that, my friends, is another story. <laughs>